I have always been much amused by the little couplet written by the poet Isaac Watts way back in the early 18th century. How proud we are, how fond to show our clothes and call them rich and new when the poor sheep and silkworm wore that very clothing long before. Amusing, but not precisely true. For only in the long dead days of prehistory was man content with raw fibers of nature. In the beginning, he sought to make them more interesting and more practical by interlacing or weaving, to beautify them through the use of primitive dyes. Later, of course, he went much beyond that. He began to search for new and more versatile fibers, for new and better ways to improve older fibers. Man is never satisfied. He has an unquenchable thirst for progress. And out of this yearning have come some of the most dramatic advances of civilization. The story of this never-ending search for better materials to weave into a better life is the story which the DuPont Company now brings you in Cavalcade of Fibers. The story of fibers has a beginning shrouded in time. Somewhere centuries ago, on a misty riverbank, a hand began to interlace the spikes of river grass or reeds and plate them into mats that would provide a primitive type of body covering. Now, at this moment, civilization took a giant step forward. For from this simple discovery, the fact that natural materials could be plated together was born the art of weaving, a way of making primitive clothes, fishnets, baskets, in his persistent search for materials that would provide covering and decoration, primitive man was constantly experimenting. The gay plumage of birds attracted his eye. And in South America, and the Hawaiian Islands particularly, the art of feather weaving developed. And with infinite patience and skill, garments of breathtaking beauty were fashioned. In Samoa, the bark of the tapa tree was soaked, then beaten flat to produce a cloth-like material that could be used for draping and clothing. Now, this little handbag, found in the grave of an Egyptian woman who died 3,500 years ago, is made of plated animal hair. Pendants of vines from New Guinea, and from Hawaii, this necklet, woven of human hair. But neither feathers nor bark, vines nor hair, could be readily spun into thread. And so man continued his search for a better fiber, now, if we had a microscope powerful enough, we could see that the molecular structure of a fiber resembles a chain of beads. Each molecule hooks on to the one in front and the one behind, forming a long, continuous chain. Now, naturally, all fibers are not alike. Only a few can be drawn out, twisted, and spun to make yarn. After centuries of trial and selection, man found four natural fibers best suited for his purpose. From the vegetable kingdom came flax to make linen, and cotton, best known of the natural fibers. From the animal kingdom came wool from goats and sheep, and from the cocoon of an insect, delicate silk. Nature provided the substance, but man provided the genius. This is a spindle whirl, the first textile device ever invented. A stick, a stone, and a clump of fiber. And yet by it, raw fiber could be drawn out and twisted into usable thread or yarn. The development of the spindle whirl was followed by the invention of the loom, making possible the weaving of cloth by mechanical means. And these two discoveries have left as deep an impression on history and civilization as any other development in the annals of man. For with the tools at hand to make cloth, with man's insatiable demand for textiles, Men could no longer depend upon the wilderness to supply their needs. They took wild things and domesticated them, sheep and goats for wool. Man became a shepherd, a
cotton and flax might grow in inaccessible places. Men learned to transplant the seed and husband the soil. And this was farming for fiber. And while some worked the fields, others spun and wove and dyed the cloth into marvelous color. Still others became traders, exchanging their goods for other desired commodities. In this way, fibers became a potent civilizing force in history, helping create not only villages and towns and cities, but the roads between them. They became a stabilizing force for society. They created skills. They provided goods and wealth. They caused man to grow. We know little of the historic origin of wool, flax, and cotton, but the Chinese have preserved for us a silken legend some 3,000 years ago, or so the story goes, Si Ling Chi, a Chinese princess, was strolling in her garden. On the lip of a mulberry leaf, she noticed a cocoon. Curious about the fleecy blanket that the insect had wrapped about itself, she took it in her hand and carefully unwound a thread of exquisite sheen. Later, she found by twisting a number of the gossamer filaments together, she was able to produce a yarn that was strong, graceful, exceedingly beautiful. Quickly, so the legend continues, Si Ling Chi made the first loom to weave the silk. And the first thing she made was a robe of silk for her emperor, the great Huang Ti. So charmed was the sovereign with the gift that in classic legend style, he married the princess and the two forever after lived in silken happiness. For centuries, China kept to itself the secret of silk but by the seventh century, groves of mulberry bushes began to rim the Mediterranean, and in cities like Lyon, France, skilled artisans began to create a whole treasure of silken fabrics. Rich brocades, the embroidery of the loom, satin, sleek and glamorous, damask, a rich weave created in Damascus and brought to Europe by the Crusaders, and the fabulous drop door, cloth of gold, as Europe emerged from the so-called Dark Ages, great fleets ranged the then known world, carrying finished textiles to markets around the world. So in this way, natural fibers wove and knit their way through the tapestry of history, spurred on the great era of invention that led to the Industrial Revolution. In 1770, James Hargraves invented the spinning jenny, a machine that could draw 16 threads or more from partially processed fiber. In the same year, Richard Arkwright constructed the first power-operated spinning frame, the beginning of the mechanization of the textile industry. And in 1789, Dr. Edmund Cartwright brought power and the beginning of mass production to the weaving of cloth with the invention of the power loom. And in America, in 1793, a Yankee schoolmaster visiting Savannah covered a wooden cylinder with the teeth of a wire comb. And in this way, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, an ingenious device for separating the seed and hulls from the fine cotton fibers. Yet despite these tremendous technological advances, up to less than 100 years ago, the world was still dependent upon the four basic natural fibers, wool, flax, cotton, and silk. But forever shortest in supply and greatest in demand was silk, the fiber of kings, available only to the royal and the rich. For centuries, alchemists concocted brews and potions attempting to find the key to artificial silk. It wasn't until the chemists, working with facts, took over from the alchemists, working with mysticism, that the triumph came. In 1884, a French chemist Count Hilaire de Chardonnay decided to create a fiber not in the fields, but in the laboratory. Now, what he did sounds simple enough. He mashed up some mulberry leaves, then treated them with the same chemicals found in the digestive tract of the silkworm. Then he forced the mixture through tiny, almost microscopic holes in the face of a glass tube. And this was the result, a filament as fine as silk, actually an artificial silk the first man-made fiber in the world. Now cloth of silken beauty was within the reach of all. 
artificial silk, eventually renamed rayon, brought the look and feel of royal raiment at a price all could afford. Shortly after World War I, acetate, the second man-made fiber, was developed. Produced from a cellulose base, it gave the world a fiber of true luxury, creating a world of new, glorious fabrics. But the real goal, a fiber totally engineered for modern living, was still ahead. Just outside of Wilmington, Delaware in 1927, two men met and talked quietly. They never mentioned the word fiber. One was Mr. Lamont DuPont, then president of E.I. DuPont and Moores and Company. The other was Dr. C.M.A. Stein, then chemical director of DuPont. The word they did mention was research. They assembled a team of brilliant young scientists headed by Dr. Wallace H. Carruthers to begin study of a complex chemical process known as polymerization. How and why small molecules unite to form giant molecules. Months of study, trial, and experiment followed, and much new knowledge was discovered about how to join small molecules end to end, somewhat like a chain of paper clips. Chemical equations were translated into chemical realities, and one day, a molten polymer was drawn out in the form of a long fiber. Now, this in itself was an historic scientific milestone, the first truly synthetic fiber something absolutely new under the sun. Now, the first fibers proved impractical, but the study went on. Many different fibers were found, and all were put aside for one reason or another. But finally, in the middle 1930s, came the fiber now known to the world as nylon. Nylon, with no counterpart in nature, as the very arrangement of molecules that make it up are designed by man. Today, nylon, and its sister synthetic fibers, Orlan acrylic fiber and Dacron polyester fiber are so completely woven into the pattern of our lives that it's hard to believe that only decades ago they didn't exist. Today they've joined the natural fibers not as rivals or substitutes, but as something new and wonderful to help create a better, an easier, a more rewarding way of life. We've come a long way from plating reeds near a riverbed and there is more, much more to come in the years ahead. When I was in Washington recently, I stood in front of the magnificent archives building and read five words chiseled in marble. What is past is prologue. How wonderfully true that is. History is the past, and yet it is only the beginning. The history of fibers, which you have just seen, is an accounting of great milestones, great developments in the past. But in no sense is the story over. All that has happened, all of the wonderful progress we have made in developing modern fibers for modern living is only the brief beginning to the marvels which lie ahead. What they will be, well, that is for the crystal gazers to say. But where they will be born, that's simple to prophesy. For they will be born in great laboratories, research centers such as those established by the DuPont Company. Look into them, and you look into your own future. These are times of challenge and change. Yes, a changing world, creating new conditions, new needs, new demands. To meet this challenge, we turn to the crucible of change, research. For companies such as DuPont, research is a never-ending adventure, a large investment in the future, your future, and mine. At the DuPont Company, research falls into two main categories. Fundamental research, the search for new knowledge, knowledge for the sake of knowledge, research for tomorrow. Second. Applied research, testing new products and processes, developing new and better technology, research for today. This is the experimental station, heart of DuPont's intensive fundamental research program. Here, close by the spot where Eleuther Irene DuPont built his first powder mill in 1802, 
DuPont scientists are helping to weave tomorrow's pattern of better living today. Here, chemists and physicists constantly probe the unknown, seek to unlock the secrets of nature. Search today for the knowledge we need to create the new wonders of tomorrow. Now, this is pure science, study, theory, and experiment with no specific commercial objective in view. In a sense, it is a gamble on man's intellect, on his unceasing drive to fashion a better world. Out of fundamental research has come such basic knowledge as that which led to the development of all three of DuPont's man-made fibers, nylon, dacron polyester fiber, Orlon acrylic fiber. Here today is the promise of tomorrow, the rich promise of fabrics, clothing, home furnishings, engineered to make our lives easier, more comfortable. A few miles from the experimental station is DuPont's textile research laboratory, center for DuPont's applied research program on its man-made fibers. As the experimental station is the laboratory for tomorrow, the Textile Research Laboratory is the workshop for today, tackling the very practical problems of improving existing fibers, determining the value of experimental fibers, developing new and improved ways of using fibers. Now here, for example, is one of the most unique facilities in the laboratory, the textile industry in miniature, every phase of it. New fibers, ideas for new fabrics, New processes take their first steps toward commercial reality on this small-scale equipment. But there are also full-scale textile machines like these looms, capable of weaving many types of fabrics so that DuPont can learn how new or modified fibers will perform under actual operating conditions. Now, this Trico machine for manufacturing fabric for lingerie and blouses is similar to those found in the most modern textile mills in the country. The same is true of this knitting machine, this dyeing vat, this finishing machine. Skilled technicians operate all of this intricate machinery. Of course, machines are only part of the story. Highly trained chemists and engineers are continually working to expand our knowledge of textiles, studying characteristics and properties of new fibers testing them, developing new and better blends of different fibers. Our fast-moving world makes ever-changing demands on textiles. Here, answers are provided, tested and proven, long before a finished product reaches the shelves of your favorite store. And this is most important. The DuPont Company neither makes nor sells fabrics of any kind. It only supplies the basic yarn to the textile industry. Yet here at the textile laboratory, engineers, chemists, designers, and other specialists exercise their talents to the benefit of the entire industry and ultimately to the benefit of all of us. For instance, these textile engineers are experimenting with new constructions for nylon carpeting. Out of their experimenting will come information of value to carpet manufacturers, data which will reflect itself in longer carpet life, easier cleaning, greater texture retention. Here you see a fabric designer weaving a tiny piece of cloth made from an experimental fiber, a fiber from which textile mills may someday make wholly unique fabrics. And in this section of the laboratory, Technicians are studying ways to improve a new process for finishing fabrics. This process, already used by many mills, is designed to enhance the luster and feel of a fabric. These are but a few examples of how DuPont know-how, gained by painstaking research, is constantly being shared with the textile industry so that you, the consumer, the king of commerce, can best enjoy the benefits of more beautiful, more practical fabrics, born of man-made fibers. The goal, the promise of DuPont's continuing program of textile research.
I feel certain that no one will question the fact that in research, we find the rich promise of tomorrow. And that's not only in terms of fibers and fabrics, but in the still more basic terms of our expanding economy and our dynamic American way of life. I hope you have enjoyed this film. I know I have